Hey, good morning, church. Welcome. It's great to have you here today. If you're new here today, a special welcome to you. My name is Brenton. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. Uh, let's all stand together as we begin. Uh, it's just such a joy to have you with us uh, for church today. Uh, it's such a joy and a privilege to be able to get together with our family, to be united with one another through Jesus Christ. This is an awesome opportunity that we have. Each of you have, have set this time aside to draw near to the Lord, to seek His face, to encounter Him. And so would you join me? I'm going to pray. Would you just join me in praying and just setting our hearts toward the Lord? Father God, we thank you for the chance to be here in your house today. Lord, would you come and be with us? Would you fill this room with your presence, Lord? You are a majestic God. You are a holy God. You are a powerful God and so worthy of all the praise that we can offer. So we lift up your name. We declare your might, your power, your strength today. Would you be exalted as we sing to you this morning? Amen. Let's sing together to the Lord.
Scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, all things are made new. All things are made new. That is the, that is the truth, that is the promise that we are celebrating right now, that we are declaring right now, that through the, the death of Jesus Christ, that he bore upon himself our sin and shame and guilt. Now we receive his forgiveness. We are in Christ and we have been made into a new creation. We are born again. And what that means is we, we don't have to continue to try to, to rehabilitate our old self, but instead we're given a new nature. We are made completely new. And now we can live and walk in the power of God, filled with the Spirit of God, uh, living for Him and honoring Him in our life. Something that was impossible before, now is possible. So we get to declare that together and celebrate that together, hopefully in your heart today, as we're singing these words, you would say, Lord, thank you, thank you that I am made new, that I no longer have to walk in my old ways or, or carry the, the baggage of my old self, but I've been made complete, I've been renewed, I've been made new. So Lord, we thank you for that. We declare that today. Would you make that so real in our heart, in our spirit this morning? Christ who lives within me, Christ who lives within me. From beginning to the end, you deserve the glory, you deserve the glory. Sing that out from beginning. Oh, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me, Christ who lives within me.
once more. You are God, you're the great I am. Breath of life, I breathe you in. Even in the fire, I'm alive in you. You are strong in my brokenness, sovereign over every step.
So Lord, we, we call out to you and declare your, your holiness, your power. Lord, we recognize that you alone are holy. That is a, a special word that can only be used to describe you. Unlike anyone or anything else, Lord, you are our perfectly holy. Lord, you are merciful and mighty. You are, you are the God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, this morning we just sing to you and lift up this song, hallelujah. Lord, you reign, you are over all, you are, you are sovereign, you are exalted, you are high and lifted up. And so we recognize that and declare that and, and worship you in the midst of that today. And Father God, it's our, our joy and our privilege this morning to worship you through singing these songs and declaring who you are, and also through giving to you our, our tithes, our offerings, bringing our gifts to you. Lord, as a way to, to, to take part in the work that you are doing, as a way to surrender to you. So as we give today, would you, would you bless these gifts that we bring? Lord, would, would you honor them and, and use them for your glory and your kingdom. That's our prayer. That's our desire. So we ask that. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. You guys can take a seat. Our ushers are going to come in just a moment. We're just going to continue to sing and worship the Lord together.
Right now, we, we just come before you, Lord. We, we find ourselves just in awe of you. Just right now in this moment of, of stillness and quiet, Lord, we, we set our eyes to you and just are in wonder of, of who you are, of your love towards us, the great I am. today as we have come to meet with you Lord would you would you meet with us would you speak to us and fill us up and uh, Lord continue to transform us toward yourself we're so thankful that we have been made new that the old is passed away that all things have become new that we are alive in you that it is no longer I who live is no longer us, but is Christ who lives in us. So we celebrate these things today, Lord, and rejoice in them and bless your name. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, hey, why don't you take a second for just a moment and say hello to someone nearby before we continue. <laughs> Well, good morning, church. Uh, hey to everybody over in Sanctuary, too, as well. My name is Anne, and I'm on staff here at Calvary. And if you are new here today, we wanted to extend a special welcome to you and let you know that we'd love to meet you. Um, we have a welcome center right outside of these doors over to the right, or you can head to the back of Sanctuary, too, if that's where you are. Uh, we have a gift for you and would love to meet you, answer any questions you might have about our church. Um, so just try to make it over there if you are new. So our church's vision is to see Jesus famous in all things 
And one of the ways that we get to do that is through reaching out to our community through acts of mercy. So this is something that I get to focus a lot of my time here as uh, my job at the church. Um, so if you were here last week, you heard of the announcement that Judith or Chesley gave that today we're focusing in on an area of outreach that is really close to our hearts, and that's the area of foster care. So for the last five or six months, um, our church has been meeting monthly with the county government and with the local foster care agencies to discuss the most pressing issues that are facing children in foster care in our county and how the church can be involved. So during one of those meetings, a program manager was discussing the crisis that they're facing in finding enough homes for um, children in foster care. 116 kids, in fact, need more permanent homes. She said this exact phrase, the orphans are in distress. So if that sounds familiar, that is straight from um, the book of James in the Bible, uh, chapter 1, verse 27. So the orphans being in distress should not be the case. Um, and this is something that they're asking the church, they're asking Christians um, to participate in addressing. So to wrap our heads around this issue and the ways that we all can help, um, we're going to watch a video and learn a little bit more. There are lots of needs and lots of kids, right? We've got more than 60,000 children in foster care just in California. We had 20 children over the age of 16, 16 to 18 years old, who we could not find placement for. And this group is, is special. This group is, is wonderful. Um, they really require very often uh, specialized parenting. And those are the children that we really could not find homes for. Um, there's a real need. All of the children that come into care have trauma. And so all of these children need some special services besides um, the normal love that we want to give every child. When people come to us um, at Kinship Center to get a home study done, they're interested in being a foster parent or maybe doing some emergency foster care or maybe they're looking to adopt from foster care, our home study gets them ready for any of that. They become what's called concurrent parents so that they can be prepared to provide short-term or long-term care for a child or ultimately be the adoptive placement for that child. Um, so. They can provide respite for another foster family, perhaps, who needs to just get um, grounded and, and rejuvenated uh, to continue their good work. All parents need to get away for the weekend, right? It's, you know, you need the two days away from the hustle and bustle of school, all those schedules, being a family. So a respite person could provide short-term care. So there are different levels of commitment. Being a resource family, doesn't really cost anything except for the openness of your heart and the willingness of you to commit time to these children. We have a wonderful foster parent who is in her 80s. Um, she uh, is uh, a nurturer and she has probably nurtured and cared for over 100 children for us. So it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter how fancy your house is. Uh, what matters is the ability to love and nurture and care for these children. I think about you know the kids in light of all the violence in the world and all the brokenness and the family chains that never get broken. We are an opportunity to step in and break a family chain. We are an opportunity to take and infuse God into a life into a heart. But you must bond with them like you'll always have them because they must, from that early moment, have strong bonding. The biggest commitment is, or biggest quality or most important, is love, and you've been called to do it. And they need that loving family, and they need the church to help support them. We can't all change the world, but we can change the world one child. If just one child's life is changed because of us, it's worth it. If one child gets to hear about Jesus because of us, it's worth it. If one child gets
gets to experience love from us, then it's worth it. Is it worth it? Yeah. Hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And I wouldn't change it for the world. So while we were filming this video last month, um, I was able to sit through all of those interviews. And by the end of the day, I was basically an emotional puddle on the floor. Um, it's really heavy, isn't it? Um, but these professionals and these parents are so passionate about fighting on behalf of children in foster care. But at the same time, I was so encouraged because I learned about all the different ways that we can engage this issue and provide care for these kids. So if this is something that God is asking you to do, respond in faith and maybe head out after service and chat with an agency representative on the patio, some of whom were in this video that you just saw, and ask them when their next foster care information meeting is. So we have representatives from Monterey County Social Services, Kinship Center, and Aspirinet. So nobody's gonna make you sign on the dotted line or commit to anything today. And there are so many ways to get involved. You can do short-term care, respite care for other foster families, um, long-term and adoption. You can be married or single. You don't have to own a home. You can be in the military. You don't have to be sure right now, but if you feel that tug, today's a really great opportunity to just learn more. So we even have Pastor Keith and his wife Shannon here from Shoreline. Um, they're skipping their church service to be with us um, because they're so passionate about getting our churches involved in this. So they are amazing, faithful, obedient believers. So be sure to connect with them after service as well. So even if you aren't in a place to consider foster care or adoption right now, um, would you mind swinging by one of the tables and just thanking these agency representatives for spending their entire Sunday here with us? Um, they're here all day, and this isn't a normal work day for them. So uh, they do really difficult boots on the ground work, and they could really use your encouragement as well. So a few weeks ago, we learned in Pastor Nate's sermon that God goes with us, especially in those moments when we choose the difficult thing. So God is not a God of fear, but of courage. So let him be courageous for you if you choose to walk with him into this calling. I think we can so often get overwhelmed thinking we can't make a difference with the level of brokenness and hurt that we see in this world. Um, but this is a tangible way for you to make a difference. Those 116 kids who need homes and they need families, that sounds like a lot, but maybe God is asking you to make a difference in just one of their lives. So please be thinking and praying about that. We'll be out on the patio after service, and uh, we're going to head into the teaching now. So if you don't have a Bible, please raise your hand. We'll get one into your hands, and then Pastor Nate's going to come and lead us through 1 Samuel. All right, thank you, Anne. Good morning, everyone. Real touching stuff, and I'm gonna attempt to teach the Bible after you know, thinking about a concept like that. And uh, as we're turning in our Bibles today to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 23, I think the thing that I would just say to you pastorally is just if the Lord at all is tugging on your heart in this area that we just talked about, uh, just commit yourself to uh, one or two of the introductory meetings that you're going to need to do anyways to go through this process. It's, uh, you don't, uh, there's, a, there's training that's involved before you're qualified to become a foster parent, so uh, there's plenty of time to just kind of glean that information and learn as you go through it. So commit to that introductory meeting and go out to the county and, and uh, check it out uh, if that's something that you're, you're wondering. Is the Lord tugging on my heart in that kind of way? And, and through that process, you might just get the confirmation and, and, and learn what you need to learn uh, before uh, per perhaps stepping into it. All right, today we're in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 23. We're going through the life of David verse by verse and uh, just been a lot of fun being able to go through this with you. This is our ninth study uh, looking at the life of David. So uh, a couple weeks ago, we went through chapter 21 and 22. So that's why we're in chapter 23 today. And then last week, we went back to only the first two verses of chapter 22. So I, we did two chapters one week, and then we did two verses last week. So I just wanted to show you that I could still do that if, uh, if I wanted to. 
All right, I still got it in me. <laughs> I could do a two-verse teaching. Um, and uh, today, we're going to go into this next episode. So just a little reminder for you, if you haven't been here for a while, David has already slain Goliath, but he's still a young man. He's already anointed to be the future king of Israel, but he's not yet the king. Uh, Saul, who has become David's father-in-law, he married Saul's daughter, uh, is now jealous of David, envious of David, and resisting God's clear and determined will. And so since he still wants to be the king and doesn't want David to be the king, he's trying to kill David. And so David has run for his life to protect and preserve his own body. And remember a couple weeks ago, we saw David really running in fear. You know, he thought to himself, he said things out loud like, there's but a step between me and death. So he had started to disbelieve the promises of God uh, for his life, uh, but, but, but then he went through a time where by going into a cave and in a place called Adullam, God ministered to his heart, so now he's doing well, all right? So the doubt is gone. He's walking with the Lord again. He's not running, and in Moab, he's not running, and in the Philistine region, he's actually in Judah, in Israel, amongst God's people, all right? And so what we're going to look at today is David being led by the Spirit of God, and God speaking to David in a few different ways. And so today, I'm going to talk to you. I've actually entitled the message, Hearing God's Voice. And I have to tell you, that's a scary title for me to put on a teaching because I'll just say it like this. Maybe you'll understand what I, what I'm, what I mean by this. I've met a lot of really weird people who have told me they've heard God's voice before. All right. It's almost like I want to have an individual three-hour appointment with each one of you before I tell you whether I think you might be able to hear God's voice. <laughs> All right. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little scary for me to say this because I understand that people have even been able to take the clear teaching of God's Word, God's Word even says this, and twist it to their own destruction. All right. So with fear and trepidation, though, I want to move into this because I do think that the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit of God wants to lead our lives, that he wants to speak to us, that he wants to guide us. And so I'd like to talk to you about that this morning uh, as we see it revealed in the life of David, all right? So I just uh, I, there's a lot of cross-references, a lot of scriptures we're going to go through today. I've posted them all online or most of them online for you. So if you want to go there and get the notes for this later on, uh, please be my guest. But let's read the first five verses of this chapter, and then I'm just going to open in a word of prayer and ask God to help us to hear him right now as we look into his word. So in verse 1, again, David is back in Israel. It says, now they told David, verse 1, behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord and, and asked the Lord, shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, at this point we don't know how he said it to David, but only that he said to David, go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But, verse 3, David's men said to him, behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? And David inquired, verse 4, of the Lord again. And the Lord answered him, arise. Go down to Keilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Okay, so Father, we just come to you today. And Lord, we want to hear your fatherly voice speaking into our hearts. Lord, we want you to have access to lead our lives, to direct our lives, to say to us as your children, go and wait, and for you to be able to warn us and encourage us and direct us. We long for that, Lord. We need your help. We need your wisdom. And Lord, we're walking around here on earth, and like David, who had this question, should I do this or should I do that? We Lord, walk around on earth, and we feel those questions quite constantly. Lord, what do you desire? What do you want? Should we do this, or should we do that? So, Lord, we pray that you'd build us up today uh, more and more to be able to know your word, and therefore, in a, in a sense, to be able to know more clearly your desire and your will for our lives. So help us, Lord, we pray. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Well, maybe you've had this experience before. You don't have to tell me if you have, but just think about this. Have you ever had the experience where someone is trying to explain themselves to you, and they're maybe talking about something that they feel, something they've gone through, and as you're listening to them, and you're trying to track with them, you're really focused, have you ever had the experience where you say to yourself, I have no idea what they're talking about? (laughs) Have you ever been there? Uh, Some of you are married, so I know you've been there before, (laughs) right? Okay, and, and then... On the, on the flip side, have you ever had the, the reverse experience where you, you're sharing, you're opening your heart, you're trying to communicate, and you just have this sense that the, what you're communicating, how it's coming out, it's falling short. And the person that you're trying to speak with, the person you're trying to connect to, you just have that sense, I don't think that they are understanding me. And sometimes... Maybe you've been here. It's not even that you feel that there's an error or a flaw in them, but you feel it within your own heart. You feel within yourself, I'm having a hard time getting this out. I'm having a hard time being clear. I'm having a hard time even knowing what it is that I'm wanting or desiring to say. Okay. In all of those instances that I just mentioned, what you have are finite beings attempting to communicate with one another. Finite beings attempting to understand one another. Okay? There is a God, an infinite, transcendent, holy, majestic, timeless, eternal God who desires to communicate to finite people living in time and space who are marred by sin and history and self-will and determination and fleshiness. Imagine the complexity of that communication. Here's the thing that we need to understand, though. If there is a breakdown in the communication between God and humanity, it is not the fault of God, it, it, it li- the fault lies with humanity. You see, God is actually very good at communicating himself. Uh, he has written for us 1,189 chapters right here in this book of self-revelation for us to be able to know him and to discover him. He has given to us, even without this book, grand revelation of himself in the creation that he has made, if only we'll listen, if only we'll observe. And he has given to us, if we will not suppress it, he has given to us a conscience by which we can understand even moral things about God that we should be able to discover even without the scripture, even without the Bible. And most beautifully, God has given to us the death of his own son. If you ever want to learn about God, if you ever want to know what God is like, if you ever want to know his nature, if you ever want to know how he feels, if you ever want to know how he processes humanity and what he thinks, you can look to the cross of Christ and learn so much of God in the cross of Jesus Christ. All right, so there is a God who wants to and is good at, is the proposition I'm making today, communicating with his people. But because we are who we are and we're walking around on earth and we got our flesh and we got our sin and we got our history and all that kind of stuff, we have to learn how to listen to him. We have to learn how to hear his voice. We have to learn how to receive from him. And in the passage in front of us, David heard the voice of the Lord. David was directed by God at multiple different crossroads of this next episode. And so I want to take a look at that today and and think about how to really interact with and hear the voice of the Lord. Now, in the first movement, the first part of the episode that we read, we read verse one through five together. And it's really interesting because David, uh, he's 
back in Israel. His team is building. We've looked at that already. His team is building. He went out and fled for his life pretty much alone. He might have had a handful of young men with him, uh, but now he has 400 uh, men that have joined themselves to him. Remember that from last week? 400 guys came out to the cave. They were in distress. They were indebted, and they were bitter in soul, so real winners. They all came out to David, and, uh, and he's kind of got this group. And remember, he had more than that group. He also had his own personal prophet. His team is building. The guy's name was Gad. And uh, Gad's first prophecy to David was to tell David to go back to Judah. David had been running to Moabite territory, Philistine territory, and Gad the prophet says, hey man, don't fear, God's gonna be with you. Go back into Israel. Even though Saul's gonna look for you there, God's gonna protect you, so go back into Israel. And then also he had his priest, a guy named Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech. So I'm saying all that just to say his team is building. He's got his 400, he's got his prophet who's gonna be his prophet for the entirety of his kingly reign, and he's also got his priest who will also serve as priest once he becomes king in Israel, this guy named Abiathar. So he's got his team. The citizens in Keilah are under attack from the Philistines. They hear that the Philistines are coming. And it's interesting because we read this, they then approach, who do they go and tell? They do not go to tell their king, Saul, they go and tell their future King David. Isn't that fascinating? It's like everybody in Israel is starting to figure it out. They're like, David is good at killing Philistines. Saul, not so much. So when the Philistines come, they start running to David. So David goes to the Lord, God, are the Philistines going to attack Keilah? And do you want me to defend them? And somehow, in his inquiry of God, God speaks to David and says, they will attack and you should defend them. All right, so then David goes back to his 400 guys and he tells them, this is what we're doing. And we read it there, but the, the 400 men, they do not respond with a bunch of faith. They do not respond like Jonathan's armor bearer in chapter 14, everything that's in your heart, you go and do it, we are with you. They actually respond with a little bit of fear. A lot of times this will happen in your life when the Lord is leading your life. He's going to ask you to do something that is scary. And when you tell the people in your life that, hey, I think God wants me to make this sacrifice or do this thing or take this step of obedience, you got to be ready for that. The people in your life attached to you might say, whoa, I haven't heard that. I'm a little scared of that. And they might be a little nervous. And these guys were a little bit nervous. And what they were nervous of was becoming public. If they went and defended Keilah, then Saul would know of their whereabouts, and so they're nervous about that. And so David, rather than saying, oh, ye of little faith, rather than looking at them and saying, if you're having a hard time running with the men, how can you run with the horses? Rather than ridiculing their strength, notice what happens. David, we saw, we saw went back and inquired of the Lord again. He inquired of the Lord again. I'm so glad that this episode is first in this study today because when it comes to hearing the voice of the Lord, when it comes to being led by the Lord, when it comes to receiving God's insights and impressions and confirmations, when it comes to this in our lives, one of the massive key ingredients that you've got to have is you've got to have this thing that David had, the humility, the humility to say, I may have gotten it wrong. You've got to have the humility, number one, this is what I'm looking at here, to, to seek confirmation, to seek the confirming will and word of the Lord. You know, you might be in your quiet time, you might be reading the Bible and some verse might stand out to you and that verse you might think, man, I think that, you know, this is pointing, I've been praying about this thing and now that's a confirmation to me. But the people in your life might, be, might say to you, hey, could you pray that, about that a little bit longer? 
could you go to the Lord a little bit longer about that? Could we be sure and certain that this is actually, truly, really something that is of the Lord? And David had that humility. You see, if someone does not have this humility, then it's more than likely that they are not hearing the voice of the Lord, but they are hearing the voice of self-will and self-determination. But the humble spirit is the spirit that says, God, I want you to confirm this within my heart and within my life. Now, I'm using the word confirmation right now. Some of you might even use this word in your everyday, like, Christianese vernacular. You know, like, oh, it's confirmation. I had somebody say this to me the other day. I, I uh, wrote an article about writing uh, about the Bible. And uh, when I write different articles, I basically write them, then edit them, and two to three months before they're going to go live, I queue them up. And then I just forget what I wrote. And so I don't know on any given day what is going to come out that particular day. And so this particular day came about where a friend of mine was praying, Lord, do you want me to start a blog where I get to take Bible scripture that I learned when I was in Bible college and in my walk with the Lord, and I'm going to write about the Bible, you know, and, and the, the experiences of my life in that kind of format. And on that very day, they came across this article that I wrote, and what, this is what they said to me. It was confirmation, right? That's Christianese for saying, I've been praying about this. There's been all kinds of times where the, I've, I've sensed the Lord speaking to me through his word about this thing, and I've gotten this impression, and now here's this thing that just, it feels so loudly that God is confirming his desire in my life. So I wanted to give to you a few different solid paths of confirmation that you can look to in your life. Because I don't think you need to look for confirmations like, God, right now, if this is what you want me to do, make a seagull fly over my head <laughs> right at this moment or, or something like that. You know, I, I don't think that needs to be the kind of confirmation that we look to from God. There are some very solid confirmation methods that God will use. One confirmation source that God will give is an internal witness within your own soul, within your own spirit. Philippians 2 verse 13 says it this way, it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. In other words, if you're a believer, then God is working. He is working inside of your heart. And when there are those desires within you that say, I want to obey God in this particular area, I, I will to do it, I want to work in that particular area, it just might be that it is God himself who is placing that desire within your heart. This has always been a little bit of a grid for me and my my own life and walk with the Lord because what I've determined is that stuff that comes from me and from my soul and from my flesh and from my spirit is quite often self preservationist in nature. But when there are ideas that come into my mind that are sacrificial, that are going to hurt a little bit in obedience to God to be able to execute, sometimes I have this realization, well, that came from the Lord. Because Nate Holdridge does not invent those types of desires sacrificial kinds of desires that usually just do not come from within. It might be the Lord putting that into my heart, so an internal witness. Another way is that there will be the witness of, number two, other believers. Other believers. It says in Proverbs 24, verse 5 and 6, and there are many Proverbs and passages like this throughout the Bible. It says, a wise man is full of strength and a man of knowledge enhances his might for by wise guidance, you can wage your war and in abundance of counselors, there is victory. Sometimes you need the confirmation, not just of the internal witness, but you need the confirmation of good counsel around you. By many wise counselors, it says, you can wage your war. The idea is you can win the battles of your life if you have 
good counselors uh, that are in your life. Right now I'm teaching, like I often do, a little class with a group of guys who have expressed an interest in being able to teach the Bible. Let's take that one as an example, you know, that maybe someone says, I have this internal thing, I'd like to be able to share God's word better, and maybe after a few years of trying and attempting and praying for opportunities and open doors, it might be that good, solid believers come into their life and say, you know, the Holy Spirit gives a lot of different gifts to a lot of different people, and it just seems like maybe there's a different gift that God has given to you. And it might just be that it's a kind word for someone to say that that helps confirm God's call on my life. All right, so we need that wisdom. We need that counsel. Now, I should remind you that when the Proverbs especially speak of the multitude of counselors and within them, in a multitude of counsel, there is safety, what it's not saying is, listen to a hundred voices, and whatever the majority says, that's what you should do. Now, quite often in the Bible, you'll see examples of the majority thinking with the flesh, thinking without faith, thinking with fear. What you're trying to get through that multitude of counselors is the voice that is filled with faith and trust and confidence in the living God. And when you hear that counsel, that's the counsel that you want to cling to. That's the counsel that you want to embrace. Number three, there's also the confirmation of the witness of the church. And, and when I say that, what I mean is God has placed spiritual leadership into your life at varying levels. It could be a life group leader. It could be a mentor that you had when you were in high school and they poured into your life as a young Christian. Uh, it could be a pastor. It could be uh, a ministry department head or leader who's watched you serve the Lord over the years. It could be a lot of different people. But a lot of times God will give insights into your life to those individuals. And as you open up your life to them, they might be able to give a confirmation of who you are, how you're designed, and the way that God is using your life. I know for me, my eyes open wide when someone says to me, you know, I've noticed that God uses you like, and then they begin to speak. It's like, I want to know, what are you seeing? What are you experiencing? How is this impacting your life? But another great way that God will confirm his voice to us in the era that we're living in today is not just through the internal witness, not just through the witness of good and godly people in our lives, and not just through the witness of leaders that God has given to us, but also, if I could say it this way, the witness of the Holy Spirit working within us. You see, we live in a different era than David lived, and I'm going to talk about that in a few more verses, but we live in the era where the Holy Spirit of God is residing inside of us, living within us as his people. And the Holy Spirit of God, as he walks with us, as he communes with us, as our bodies, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, our temples of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit isn't there just hanging out doing nothing. No, the Holy Spirit wants to comfort encourage, direct, lead, guide, rebuke, convict. The Holy Spirit can be grieved as he's operating inside of us. These are all Bible words to describe the operation of the third person of the Trinity. Not an it, by the way. He's a he. He's not a force like Star Wars. He's living inside of you, and he loves you. He has, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, a will for you. A lot of times we think of the will of God, and the Holy Spirit is God, but have you stopped to think specifically about the will of the third person of the Trinity, the will of the Holy Spirit for your life? It says there that he gives gifts individually as he, the Holy Spirit, wills. And the Holy Spirit wants to confirm many things to you in lots of different ways. Now, there are uncommon and spectacular ways that the Holy Spirit will at times operate. Visions, dreams, the miraculous. You know that I believe that God still works in these kinds of ways here on earth. But the reality is these are the uncommon ways that the Holy Spirit will often work within us. There are 11 specific miracles recorded for us in the book of Acts, which is a history of the church of 30 years. 
11 specific miracles in 30 years, 11 specific miracles to help launch the gospel into all of the world. So I just mentioned that because sometimes we read a book like the book of Acts and we think that it's just supposed to be one just massive vision, miracle, dreams, experience that we are living in here on earth. No, that's not the reality. It is the, the rare way that God will speak and confirm things to his people. But how will the Spirit more normally or more often speak and confirm to us? Well, one way would be through the giftings that he chooses to give to us. It says in Proverbs 22, verse 29, the question is asked, do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. The idea there is that this man has a gift. This man has an ability, and that ability opens up doors within his life. What gifts has God given to you? What things has the Holy Spirit done in you that make you effective with other people? There are gifts that God has given the person seated to your right and the person seated to your left that are not yours, or if they are yours, they operate in a different way than they operate within you. And so to take a look at those gifts, that, that can be a confirming thing that the Lord will give. Also, the Holy Spirit will confirm things to us with the Word of God, with Scripture, with the Bible. I heard one pastor recently say it like this. He said, we need to stop looking for a vision, and we need to start looking for a verse. We need to be people who are saying, as I feast upon the Word of God, the Holy Spirit of God will confirm things as I'm going through uh, the Word, as I'm moving through the Scripture. It says in Ephesians 4, or excuse me, Hebrews 4, verse 12, that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You see, the Holy Spirit wants to take the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and discern and divide between the thoughts and intentions of your heart. That, to me, is amazing. Because I can't even discern the thoughts and intentions of my own heart. But the Holy Spirit of God, with the Word of God, is able to do that work in my life. So I must open up my life, I must open up my heart to the Word of God. You see, for many of us, we know maybe three or four or five verses. That's all the Holy Spirit can remind us of. But the more that you pour yourself into the Bible, and the more the Bible is poured into you, the more ammunition the Holy Spirit has to speak into your life and heart. And so the Word of God will often be a way in which the Lord, the Holy Spirit, will confirm something into your life. He'll just speak to you. He'll just speak to you. You'll just say, okay, it's just my, in my normal morning routine. I'm just opening up the Bible. Here's the bookmark. And, you know, you don't have to do this weird thing, you know, like I'm just going to like open it up and I'm going to point my finger, you know, like be, good, be careful of that one. There's some, there's some gnarly verses <laughs> in the Bible that your finger might land on on that day. You don't want to do that. You just want to keep reading forward. Okay, what's the next thing? What is God going to say to me? But then the Holy Spirit will also confirm things through impressions. Romans 8, verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit will be impressing things upon your spirit, that you're a child of God, namely, and then there will be times where he says, as a child of God, I'm asking you to do this. As a child of God, I want you to do that. And my encouragement to you is to, anytime you have an impression to, to do something good for someone else, chase that out a little bit. You know, if you just think of someone like, man, I should, I should encourage them right now. I should shoot them a text message real quick. Or I should, I mean, I know this is hard for some of you millennials, but I should call them on the phone. <laughs> you know, I should do that. It's hard for me too, you know. But as you, as you, as you think about that, act out on it. Do it. Hey, I'm just thinking it. You never know that it might be right at the right specific moment that that person needed the encouragement that would come from, from and through you. So impression. Okay, let's move on in our story. I, I can't belabor this anymore. So in verse 6, 
The story goes on, and it says, When Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, had fled to David to Keilah, he had come down with an ephod in his hand. We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Now, it was told Saul, verse 7, that David had come to Keilah. And Saul said, God has given him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. And Saul summoned all the people to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. David knew that Saul was plotting harm against him, and he said to Abiathar the priest, bring the ephod here. Then David said, verse 10, O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord, the God of Israel, please tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then David said, will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will surrender you. Then David and his men, who were about 600, arose and departed from Keilah, and they went wherever they could go. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up the expedition. All right, so this interesting thing develops. You know, David has gone down to this town called Keilah, and has saved them. And you can imagine this. It's way more fun to live in a city or a town than it is to live in a cave with 400 guys. So they stayed in Keilah. And there they are, living in Keilah, and Saul hears about it. All right, he hears about it. And so Saul, this is how deluded this guy is. He says to himself, the Lord has delivered him into my hand. That's how crazy Saul is. He sees David and Keilah as a sign that God has delivered David into his hand. And so David gets wind that Saul has built this army and is going to pursue him there in Keilah. And so David goes to God. He's very desperate. And he says to the Lord, he says, are, is Saul coming? Question one. And are they going to, the citizens of Keilah, are they going to deliver me into Saul's hand. And God says, yes, Saul is coming. And yes, the citizens of Keilah, they are going to give you over to Saul's hand. It's, it's hard to really feel great about the people of Keilah at this point because they've been saved by David, but they seem very uh, ungrateful for what David has done for them. But you do have to remember, Saul is the king in Israel, and they'd be inviting a world of hurt into their lives to protect David. So I mean, though we might not agree with them, we can at least understand where they'd be coming from in that moment. And so David, he doesn't have a heart to bring them into this battle, so he flees, all right? Now, in this whole thing, when he's asking God, speaking to God, inquiring of God, two times we have this mention of the ephod. First, it says in verse 6, Abiathar was there. He's the priest, remember? He's David's priest now, personal priest. He's running with David, and it says, when Abiathar ran to David, he had the ephod. And then when David goes to seek the Lord, he calls to Abiathar and says, bring the ephod. All right, so you guys are all down with what the ephod is, right? No, okay. So the ephod in the Old Testament, this is like a garment that the Israelite priests would wear. You guys know what a poncho is, right? You know, it's like a, like a, thing that's got no no arms but it like it's like a blanket with a hole in the middle of it right you know you wear that poncho it's kind of like a poncho a spiritual poncho all right I can't believe I'm describing it this way but and the priests would wear this as part of their attire but the high priest especially had this thing attached to his ephod called the urim and the thummim Okay, we're going deep into Old Testament stuff right now. The Urim and the Thummim, literally that means lights and perfections. Lights and perfections. We don't know exactly how the Urim and the Thummim was used in the sense that we don't know exactly what it was. Some people think it was like a, a white stone and a black stone. Some people was, think it was some kind of like gem scenario. But something would happen where in times of you know, real significant like emergency in, in Israel where like the big players needed to hear what God wanted them to do. Should we go into battle? Should we not go into battle? Stuff like that. 
they would consult the priest who would consult the Urim and the Thummim, the lights and perfections, and somehow through something being illuminated, we, again, we don't know exactly how it worked, but God would declare his desire for them in that kind of way. That's why it's listed out twice, his question. Are they coming down? Yes, because they get a yes or no answer. It, it, are they going to deliver me? Yes. All right, so that's how David determined God's voice at this point. At this point in the teaching, some of us might be sitting here going, that is incredible. I wish I had one of those. I wish I had like a sweet Urim and Thummim app or something, you know? <laughs> and when I was, you know, in just like real, like, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what I, sh you know, should I, should I say yes? Should I say no? Should I take the job? Should I go to this school? Should I go to that school? Should I do all these different things? I wish I had the Urim and the Thummim, you know, at that point and could just like, go, that's it. That's the thing, you know, that I'm supposed to do. All right? Here's the deal. If David was sitting here today, talking with all of us, he would say to us, you should not be jealous of me, I am jealous of you. Because you live in an era where Christ has ascended and poured out upon the church his spirit and deposited his spirit to live inside of each one of his children. And when I was around walking on the dust of the earth, I had the Pentateuch, I had a few other books of the Bible, but I did not have all 66 books of God's word whereby I could read and discover and hear the heart, the love, the will, the mission of God. And I did not have the kind of access to God in prayer that you have access to God in prayer in because I live in an era of the sacrificial system with a tabernacle and sacrifices and veils and curtains and rooms separating me from a direct contact with God. But when Jesus died, the veil was torn in two from top to bottom and now you have access completely to a father in heaven. You see, David would be jealous of us and the era that we are living in. So all I really wanted to say in this point is that in hearing the voice of the Lord, we want to, like David did, use every instrument that God has given us for the biblical era that we are living in. We don't live in the Urim and Thummim era. We don't live in the tabernacle era. We live in the right now era. And in this era, God has given us incredible ways to discern his voice. Obviously, the most incredible of all the ways is this book right here, the Bible, Scripture. And I'll remind you, because I'm going to tell you three instruments that God has given to us. In this first instrument, the Bible, we have to remember the authority of God's Word. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that all Scripture was breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and for training in righteousness. That means that if we disbelieve or disobey anything in this book, we are disbelieving or disobeying God himself. He has declared himself to us. He has made this book the authoritative book where he has revealed himself. Also about the Bible, we have to believe in the clarity of the Bible, the clarity of Scripture. This doctrine, the clarity of Scripture, means basically that the Bible was written in such a way that its teachings and its desires for us from God are intelligible, that, that, that we can, as everyday believers, understand in general what God's Word is asking of our lives. It's not a big, massive mystery. We don't need to look for the mysterious things or like the Bible codes inside of it or anything like that. It's just the straightforward commissions of God's word that we can easily and readily understand. For instance, in the Old Testament, God told the parents in Israel that in the morning and during the day as traveled with their children and at night when they put their kids to bed, that they were to explain the scripture to their children. Now, what God was not saying to them was, hey, after you went to seminary and after you got your masters of divinity, 
then you can explain the scripture to your children. No, what he's saying is, that's how understandable this book is. There might be doctrines that those who are gifted and educated and have studied can communicate more effectively to us, but the idea of scripture is that as we come to it, we can, it's clear enough for us to be able to get the big idea, to be able to understand it for our own lives and apply it into our own lives. In the New Testament, when Jesus was confronted with biblical conundrums, they were arguing the Old Testament. And he never once said, oh, now I get how you guys would be confused by that because I kind of wrote it in a pretty like mysterious, confusing kind of way. He never said that. It was always something going on within them, a, 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 a if, you, if you will, like a predetermined thing within them that had clouded the scripture. But in general, there is a clarity in the Bible. We must also believe that the Bible is necessary. We must believe in the necessity of scripture. I know it's not popular to believe that in our modern day and age. We want to believe that everyone could go to heaven without the Bible. But the, the reality is there are certain things that you can know of God without scripture. Just from looking at creation, the Bible teaches us this. But you cannot know the gospel and you cannot know the Lord's desires and, and, and will for your life without the scripture. This is his way of communicating to humanity. Paul said in Romans chapter 10, how, can, how are they to believe if they've never heard and how they are to hear without someone preaching? And so there must be the communication, not just from a pulpit, that's not what I'm saying, but we must, the, the, the Bible is necessary for us, and it is also sufficient. It, it contains the word of God for us. It is sufficient. So God's spoken. We can learn from his word. We're to add nothing to his word. We're con to consider no other writings equal to scripture, and uh, nothing that is sin, uh, nothing is sin that's not forbidden in this book, and nothing is required of us that's not found in this book. It's, it's all here, all right? So if one of the instruments at our disposal, number one, the Bible, the Bible. I wanted to start with that one because the second one I wanted to say was, again, the Spirit. And I, and I fear going to the Spirit first because I think a lot of folks maybe will follow their feelings rather than the Spirit, but the Spirit he does want to speak into our hearts, but the Bible must come first. But once the Bible is first and the Spirit is actively involved in our lives, he desires to minister and to speak to us. Remember Nicodemus, the great teacher of Israel? That was his title, the teacher of Israel. He was trying to make determinations about Jesus, but Jesus said to him, you can't even see the kingdom of God unless you're born again, born of the Spirit. The Spirit must come to live inside of you to be able to see accurately the Word of God, to see the will of God. If you want the Spirit to lead you, let me give you some suggestions. Number one, be quiet before Him. Have some part of your life, some time in your day that is just quiet before God. We live in a very noisy world. If I stopped talking and we just sat here in silence for 30 seconds, you would start feeling weird at like second nine. I mean, it's, we live in a loud world. You need to be quiet before the Lord. Also, you must humbly ask him for help. You see, the proud man says, I don't need help, but the humble man says, I need you to help me. I need you to lead me. I don't know what to do right now. I need your guidance. You must also, when seeking to be led by the Spirit, be willing to obey what He shows you. You see, the way that we would like it to operate is, okay, I want to know what you want me to do, and then I want to be able to have like a decision time on whether I want to do that or not. But that's not the way the Lord works. The Lord is waiting for the heart that says, I will do his will. What is it? I will do his will. What is it? The person that says, what is his will? Maybe I'll do it. They, you'll hear silence. You've got to come to that place of saying, I will do what he asks me to do. 
If you want the Spirit to lead you, you must continue to look into the Bible. The Bible is your best friend in this process uh, because Scripture will be the fuel the Spirit uses to help direct and guide your life. And if you've been pouring into the Bible for 40 years and the Bible's been pouring into you, I'm confident that you know what the voice of the Lord sounds like. But if you're brand new to the Lord and you're very unfamiliar with Scripture, then I would be more cautious, you know, in that kind of season of your life. And then you must wait for his response. Wait to see what he might say to you. The last instrument we have at our disposal I wanted to mention, besides the Bible and besides the Spirit, I could list a few more, but the last one I wanted to give to you today is simply the cross of Jesus Christ. Because when you look to the cross, you see who God is. You see his love. You know his access. And, and that's where great exchanges of shame and embarrassment and fear, their exchange for freedom and forgiveness and boldness in him. All right, now let's see how our story ends. All right, verse 14 uh, to the end of the chapter, really. It says, And David remained in the strongholds in the wilderness, in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul ta- saw him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. David saw, verse 15, that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horish, and Jonathan. Saul's son rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and and I shall be next to you. So he was like partly right, uh, because Jonathan would actually die, but David would be the next king in Israel. He says, Saul, my father, knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horesh, and Jonathan went home. Then the Ziphites, verse 19, went up to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding among us in the strongholds at Horish, on the hill of Hakalah, which is south of Jeshimon? Now come down, O king, according to all your heart's desire to come down, and our part shall be to surrender him into the king's hand. And Saul said, May you be blessed by the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. Go, make yet more sure." Know and see the place where his foot is and who has seen him there, for it is told me that he is very cunning. See, therefore, and take note of all the lurking places where he hides and come back to me with sure information. Then I will go with you. And if he is in the land, I will search him out among all the thousands of Judah. All right, this is an interesting thing that that develops here. Uh, Basically, it's it's pretty simple. Uh, David is on the run. He's out in the wilderness of Ziph, and his friend, Jonathan, finds out where he is, and he comes, and he comforts him. Did you see the little phrase there? He strengthened his hand in God. Aren't friends like that an absolute blessing? That point you to the Lord. They get you to fix your eyes upon him. Uh, they, they help, you know, fill you with faith. I say it like this. Sometimes I need a friend I can, that I can borrow their faith. I can borrow their faith because mine's waning. I need to borrow their faith. And so Jonathan's there and he's pouring into David, strengthening his hand in God, kind of prophesies over him a little bit, like this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to go down. And then they make a covenant with each other. They're, these guys are always making covenants with each other. Every, every time they get together, brand new covenant. It's like their secret handshake, you know, like boom, 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 boom. Covenant, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> so they make a covenant again. That's, how, that's what David's doing. At the same time, Saul is having a different conversation. The Ziphites, these punks, <laughs> they come out and they tell Saul, they say, we know where David is. He's hiding amongst us. And Saul acts all spiritual. He's like, oh, blessings upon you. You've blessed me. You've cared for me. And then he says, but you know, this David guy, he's sneaky. And I've heard that he hides and he runs, you know, so Find out specifically where he's at. Keep an eye on him and come and tell me. And then when you tell me, I will come out and I will pursue him. Look, I don't have a lot to say about this particular portion except to simply say this. David was hearing from someone good. Saul was hearing from someone evil. David was consuming the right information. Saul was consuming the wrong information. And if you want to hear the voice of the Lord, you really do need to guard your eye gate 
You do need to guard your ear gate, and you do need to think about what you are allowing, what voices you are allowing to speak to you. The philosophers of today, whether they be the musicians or the scholars or the media or the poets, whoever they be, they ought not be the ones that are telling you how to live your life. They, they should not be the ones that you are building your life upon. Saul opened himself up to the wrong people, but David was opening himself up to the right people. And we like to deceive ourselves into thinking that we are not very impressionable. And we like to think that when we were young, that's when we were impressionable. But now that we're more mature, we are no longer impressionable. And you were. You were impressionable when you were young. I, I remember when I, was a, when I was a middle school student at Pacific Grove Middle School. Go Breakers. I remember there was this season where like, it seemed like every guy at school, this was like the late 80s, early 90s, every guy in school was buying these sports team jackets called parkas. They were basically like a sleeping bag. Like a, you just wore a sleeping bag. The thing you need to know about Nate Holdridge is I run hot. I have run hot for every day of my life. I have never been in a weather situation where I have needed a parka, ever. But I saw these dudes cruising around. I was like, I should probably get a parka. And so I did. I rocked one. I had a parka. And we like to tell ourselves as time goes on that we're now, we're, we're not as impressionable as we were before. But we are. We, we receive that influence, that pressure, even still, the world, the culture, society, it puts it upon us. So we have to make sure that we are hearing not the negative voices, but the right people, the godly people, people like Jonathan speaking into our lives. All right, so it says in verse 24, and they arose and went to Ziph ahead of Saul. Now David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon and in the Arabah to the south of Jeshimon, and Saul and his men went to seek him. And David was told, so he went down to the rock and lived in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. Saul went on one side of the mountain and David and his men on the other side of the mountain. And David was hurrying to get away from Saul. And Saul and his men were closing in on David and his men to capture them. A messenger came to Saul saying, hurry and come for the Philistines have made a raid against the land. So Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore, that place was called the Rock of Escape. And David went up from there and lived in the strongholds of En Gedi. I realize there's a lot of geography and a lot of topography that's mentioned right there. You got Maon, Ziph, Araba, the Jeshimon. You got a rock. You got a wilderness. You got, a, you got the mountain. But basically what's happening here is that David is pursued by Saul. They come to this mountain. Think of it not like a 200 miles in circumference mountain, but think of it as a large hill. Saul's band separates they're encircling the hill. They're about to descend upon David and his men. And just at that moment, a messenger comes to Saul and says, the Philistines are attacking. Saul's the king, so he's got to leave and go defend his people. This is just the, the last second kind of escape. And so David and his men, they sat there and they're like, we barely made it. It was the last second and they looked around and they're like, what should we call this rock that we almost got God at? <laughs> and they said, let's call it the rock of escape. All right. And then they fled from there and they went into the wilderness of En Gedi. This is, this is David. He heard the voice of the Lord right here. You know, he heard the voice of the Lord. He heard the voice of the Lord in the sense that he was able to look at the circumstances in that moment and say, only God operates like that. You see, we want God to operate much earlier than he often does. He's never late. He's never early. He's always right on time. And here, David is delivered right at that last second moment. That is God. You see, the thing is, God wants us to be like him. And you know what God is? Calm. And in order for the fear to get weaned out of us, 
He's got to prove his timing and his faithfulness over and over and over and over again so that we can calmly, with faith, say he is able. And so David learned that here in this moment. So there it is, hearing the voice of the Lord, David led by God, and my prayer is that we would be led by the Lord as well. So I'm not going to invite the worship team up right now. I'm just going to close in prayer, and I'm just going to pray and ask that God would speak to us and that we would be able to more and more open up our ears and our hearts to his voice and what he's saying into our lives. Father, I just want to close just praying that even right now, the fellowship that happens out on the patio or in the grill or the conversations that happen with the social workers and people that are here talking about foster care, please have your hand upon all of those interactions. Also, Lord, we pray that you'd help us to discern your desires in, in your heart. We, we love it, Lord. This is a chance for us to walk by faith and not by sight. And so we pray that you'd train us to be able to discern you more effectively than we have been able to in years past. Mature us, Lord. Grow us. Wash our hearts with your word so that we could know and, and hear your voice more effectively. So help us, God, we pray. And Lord, in ways that we can be a confirming voice in each other's lives, give us that gift, we ask. We thank you, Lord, and we pray your hand of blessing to be upon us as a church. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you guys. Have a great week.